<laughs> if you're not careful, they'll see you too. <laughs> Happy Monday. <laughs> Welcome to Quarantine Storytime. I'm Charlotte. I'm here reading War and Peace uh, with you guys live for the first time ever. And in the background, I have dancing albatrosses. You just said that you're missing out on the dancing albatrosses. Uh, so, hope everyone had a great and safe weekend. We are back and better than ever. Um, we're in volume three, part two. We're going to do just 13 and 14 today. Um, but never fear, we're making great progress and we'll be streaming on ahead. As you recall, it's the year 1812, and it seems like actually much of the world is at war. We've got, you know, the, the War of 1812 of the U.S. with Great Britain and its allies and the U.S. and its allies. We also have Napoleon invading Russia, and that's where we're focused right now. So, <clears throat> thank you to my mother for reminding me. Not that I really forgot, but definitely a good reminder of the other historical events that were happening in the world at that time. It's not a great angle for me. Um, and where we were, so old Count, old Prince Volkonsky died. Andre Volkonsky is away at the army and his sister is trying to cope now that her father who was kind of pretty mean to her all the time, but who she really loved very much and who actually loved her despite always being nasty to her. Um, now that he's died and she's like alone in the world and trying to figure out her life um, when, you know, and what to do when most of her life was spent uh, pretty much just catering to his whims. So there's that. And meanwhile, they're needing to evac, like, flee from their family home and Prince, they're at Prince Andre's estate but they need to leave there because the French are coming and they'll be there any day now. But the uh, peasants and the serfs on their land want to stay and there's um, the French have kind of been, you know, telling a lot of the Russian peasantry that, you know, if you stay and you help us out, we'll pay you for anything you give us and yada yada yada. Um, so there's a lot of peasants who would rather stay and not lose everything they have and hopefully, you know, get some compensation for anything that gets taken rather than just leave it. So that's, there's that whole other thing. But, um, yeah. Last we heard, she was still Prince Andre's estate and, you know, trying to possibly leave. All right, so we'll pick up in volume three, part two, section 13. On the 17th of August, Rostov and Ilyan, accompanied by Lavrushka, who had just returned from captivity. Uh, as you oh, as you recall, there was that moment where um, young Nikolai Rostov's, uh, one of his lackeys, Lavrushka, was captured by Napoleon's men, and he had a whole exchange with Napoleon where he gave him a lot of information, but pretended like he wasn't giving it to Napoleon. So, shysty sort of dude. Um, but he's back. So on the 17th of August, Rostov and Ilyin, accompanied by Lavrushka, who had just returned from captivity, and a Huster orderly leaving their camp in Yankovo, 10 miles from Bogachevara, went for a ride to try out a horse Ilyin had just bought and to see if there were any hay in the villages. For the past three days, Bogachevara had been between two enemy armies so that the Russian rear guard could get, as easily as, could get there as easily as the French vanguard. And therefore, Rostov, as a thoughtful squadron commander, wanted to avail himself whatever provisions had been left in Bogachevaro before the French got there. Bogachevaro is where Maria uh, Volkonsky was, and that's where her father died. Rostov and Ilyin were in the most cheerful mood. On the way to Bogachevaro, a princely estate with a manor house, where they hoped to find a large staff and some pretty girls, they either questioned Lavrushka about Napoleon and laughed at his stories or raced each other trying out Ilyin's horse. Rostov had no idea that the village he was going to was the estate of that Volkonsky who used to be his sister's fiancé. Rostov and Ilyin sent their horse, horses into a last race down the slope before, before Bogachevaro, and Rostov, getting ahead of Ilyin, was the first to gallop into the street of the village. You came out ahead, said the flushed Ilyin. Yes, always ahead, both in the meadow and here, Rostov replied, stroking his lathered dawn horse with his hand. 
And I had, I, and I'd have outraged you on this Frenchman, Your Excellency, Lavrushka said, coming from behind, calling his scruffy cart horse a Frenchman. But I didn't want to shame you, as they rode at a walk towards a barn by which a large crowd of muzhiks was standing. Some of the muzhiks took off their hats. Some, without taking off their hats, looked at the approaching officers. Two tall old muzhiks with wrinkled faces and sparse beards came out of the pothouse and, smiling, swaying, and singing some nonsensical song, went up to the officers. Fine lads, said Rostov, laughing. Got any hay? So alike, said Ilyan. A very merry talk, the Muzhiks sang away with blissful smiles. One Muzhik stepped out of the crowd and approached Rostov. Who might you be, he asked. Frenchman, Ilyan replied, laughing. Here's Napoleon himself, he said, pointing to Lavrushka. So you'd be Russians, the Muzhik asked again. Have you got many forces here? asked another rather short Muzhik going up to them. Many, many, replied Rostov, but why are you gathered here, he added. Is there a feast? The old man get, got together on village business, the Muzik replied, stepping away from him. Just then, two women and a man in a white hat appeared on the road from the manor house, walking towards the officers. The one in pink's mine, no haggling, said Ilyan, noticing Danyusha resol resolutely heading towards him. Ours, Lavrushka said to Ilyan with a wink. What do you want, my beauty, said Ilyan, smiling. The princess asked me to find out your names and regiments. This is Count Rostov, the squadron commander, and I am your obedient servant. A talky talk, the drunken Muzik sang away, smiling blissfully and looking at Ilyan, talking with the maid. Following Dunyasha, Alpadich went up to Rostov, taking off his hat while still some distance away. I make so bold as to trouble you, your honor, he said respectfully but with a relative scorn for the youth of this officer, and putting his hand behind his lapel. My mistress, the daughter of the general-in-chief, Prince Nikolai Andreevich Bolkonsky, who passed away on the 15th instant, being in difficulty on the occasion of the ignorance of these persons, he pointed to the Mosaics, asked you kindly, would you be so good, Alpatich said with a sad smile, as to ride off a little, for it is so inconvenient in front of, Alpatich pointed to the two Mosaics who flitted about him like gadflies around the horse. Eh, Alpatich, eh! Yakov Alpadich, a grand thing. Forgive us, for Christ's sake. A grand thing, eh? The Mosek said, smiling joyfully at him. Rostov looked at the drunken old men and smiled. Or perhaps your excellency finds this amusing, Yakov Alpadich said sedately, pointing to the old men with the hand not put behind his lapel. No, it's not very amusing, said Rostov, and he rode aside. What's the matter, he asked. I make so bold as to report to your excellency that the coarse local people do not allow our mistress to, quite, to quit the estate and threatened to unharness the horses so that, though everything has been packed since morning, Her Excellency cannot leave. It can't be, cried Rostov. I have the honor of reporting the real truth to you, Alpatich confirmed. Rostov got off his horse and, turning it over to the orderly, went to the house with Alpatich, questioning him about the details of the matter. Indeed, the princess's offer of grain to the Musiks the evening before and her talk with the drawn and, with drawn and to the gathering had so spoiled things that drawn had definitely handed over the keys joined the Mosheks and refused to come when su summoned by Alpatich. And in the morning, when the princess ordered them to harness up for leaving, the Mosheks came to the bar in the large crowd and, set and sent to tell the princess that they would not let her out of the village, that there was an order not to leave, and that they would unhitch the horses. Alpatich went to them, trying to bring them the reason, but they answered him, Cart did most of the talking, Drawn did not appear in the crowd, that it was impossible to let the princess go, that there was an order about it, but let the princess stay, and they would serve her as before and obey her in everything. Just when Rostov and Ilyan came galloping down the road, Princess Maria, despite the attempts of Apatich, the nanny, and the maids to dissuade her, had ordered the harnessing and wanted to leave, but seeing the two cavalrymen gallop by, they took them for French, the coachmen fled, and the women in the house began to weep. Dearest, my dearest, God has sent you, deeply moved voices were saying as Rostov passed through the front hall. Princess Maria, at a loss and strengthless, was sitting in the reception room and lost... Rostov was brought to her. She did not understand who he was or why he was there or what had happened to her. Seeing his Russian face and recognizing him by the way he walked in and by his first words, as a person of her own circle, she looked at him with her deep and luminous eyes and began to speak in a faltering voice, trembling with agitation. Rostov immediately imagined something romantic in this encounter. A defenseless, grief-stricken girl alone left to the mercy of coarse, mutinous muzhiks. And what a strange fate has pushed me, pushed me to come here, thought Rostov, listening to her and looking at her. And what meekness, what nobility in her features and expression, he thought. 
listening to her timid account. When she mentioned that it had all happened the day after her father's funeral, her voice trembled. She turned away and then, as if fearing that Rostov might take her words for a wish to move him to pity, gave him a questioningly frightened glance. Tears welled up in Rostov's eyes. Princess Maria noticed it and looked at Rostov gratefully with that luminous gaze which made one forget the plainness of her face. I cannot express to you, Princess, how happy I am that I have come here accidentally and will be in a position to show you my readiness, Rostov said, getting up. Go, please, and I will answer to you on my honor that not a single person will dare cause you any trouble, if only you will allow me to escort you. And, bowing respectfully as one bows to a lady of royal blood, he went to the door. With the respectfulness of his tone, Rostov seemed to be showing that, though he would consider himself fortunate to make her acquaintance, he did not want to use the occasion of her misfortune to become closer to her. Princess Maria understood and appreciated that tone. I'm very grateful, very grateful to you, the princess said to him in French, but I hope it is all a misunderstanding and that no one is to blame for it. The princess suddenly began to cry. Excuse me, she said. Rostov frowned, gave her one more low bow, and left the room. Section 14. Well, what? Is she pretty? No, brother, my pink one's lovely, and her name is Dunyasha. But glancing at Rostov's face, Ilyam fell silent. He saw that his hero and commander was in quite a different frame of mind. Rostov gave Ilyan an angry look and without replying, headed at a quick pace for the village. I'll show them, I'll give it to them, the brigands, he was saying to himself. Alpatich, gliding along, all but running, followed behind Rostov, barely keeping up with him. What decision have you been pleased to take? He said, catching up with, Ro with him. Rostov stopped and clenching his fist, showed su turned, suddenly turned on Alpatich threateningly. Decision? What decision? You old cod, he yelled at him. Where were you looking, eh? The Muslims are rebellious and you can't handle them. You're a traitor yourself. I know you all. I'll have your hides. And as if fearing to expend his store of anger uselessly, he left Alpatich and quickly went on. Alpatich, suppressing his offended feeling, glided hurriedly after Rostov and went on telling him his reflections. He said that the peasants were ob obdurate and that at the present moment it was not sensible to antagonize them. That's how it said, and Tagore Norize them. With no military detachment around, that would be better to send for a detachment first. I'll give them an army detachment. I'll antagonize them, Nikolai muttered senselessly, choking with unreasonable animal anger and the need to vent that anger. Without considering what he was going to do, unconsciously, at a quick, resolute pace, he moved towards the crowd. And the closer he came to it, the more Alpatich felt that his unreasonable action might produce good results. The Musics in the crowd had the same feeling, looking at his quick and firm stride and resolute frowning face. After the hussars rode into the village and Rostov went to the princess, confusion and discord arose in the crowd. Some of the Musics began to say that the men who had come were Russian and might take offense that the young lady was not allowed to leave. Dron was of the same opinion, but as soon as he expressed it, Karp and some of the other Musics fell upon the former headman. How many years have you been feeding off the community? Karp yelled at him. It's all the same to you. You dig up your money box and take it with you. So what's it to you if our houses are devastated? We're told there's no, to be an order. Nobody's to leave their houses, so as not a single crumb gets taken away. And that's that, shouted another. It was your son's turn, but no fear. You felt sorry for your chubsy. A little old man suddenly spoke quickly, attacking Drawn. So my Ivanka got his head shaved. Ah, we'll all die. Right, we'll all die. I'm no holdout on the community, said Drawn. So he's no holdout, grown himself an ice paunch. The two tall Musics were having their say. As soon as Rostov, accompanied by Ilyan, Lavrushka and Alpatich came up to the crowd. Park, putting his fingers behind his belt, smiled silently, stepped forward. Drawn, on the contrary, went to the back rows, and the crowd closed in more tightly. Hey, who's your headman here? shouted Rostov, coming up to the crowd with quick strides. Our headman? What do you want him for? asked Park. Before he finished speaking, his hat went flying, and his head dropped sideways from a strong blow. Hats off, traitors! cried the full-blooded voice of Rostov. Where's the headman? he shouted furiously. The headman, he's calling for the headman. You, Drun, Zakarich. The obedient voices said hurriedly, and hats began coming off heads. There's no rebelling with us. We keep order, said Karp, and several voices from the back suddenly spoke at the same time. It's like the old man decided. There's a lot of young, lots of you superiors speaking out. Rebellion, brigands, traitors, Rostov yelled senselessly in, the voice, in a voice not his own, seizing Karp by the collar. Bind him, bind him, he shouted, and though there was no one to bind him except Lavrushka and Alpatich. Lavrushka, however, ran up to Karp and seized his arms from behind. Shall I call our boys from over the hills, he shouted. Alpatich turned to the Musics 
called two by name to come and bind Carp. The Musics obediently stepped out of the crowd and began taking off their belts. Where's the head man? cried Rostov. Drawn with a frowning and pale face, stepped out of the crowd. You're the head man? Bind him, Lavrushka, cried Rostov, as if this order, too, could be met with no hindrance. And in fact, two more Musics began to bind Drawn, who, as if to help them, took off his belt and handed it to them. And you all listen to me, Rostov turned to his Musics. March off to your homes right now and don't let me hear a peep from you. Why, we don't do any harm. It was just out of stupidity. Lots of nonsense. I kept saying it was wrong. A voice, voices were heard reproaching each other. It's just as I told you, said Alpatich, entering into his rights. It wasn't nice, voice. Our own stupidity, Yakov Alpatich, voices responded, and the crowd immediately began to break up and scatter through the village. The two bound Musics were taken to the yard of the manor house. The two drunken Musics followed. Eh, just look at you, one of them said, addressing Karp, as if you can talk like that with the masters. And what were you thinking of? A fool, the other confirmed. A real fool. Two hours later, the cart stood in the yard of the Bogachevaro house. The Muzhiks were animatedly carrying out the master's belongings and loading them on the carts, and Drawn, freed at the princess's request from the storeroom in which he had been locked, stood in the yard ordering the Muzhiks about. Be careful how you set it down, said one of the Muzhiks, a tall man with a round, smiling face, taking a chest from a maid's hands. It costs money. It also costs money. If you throw it down like that or put a rope on it, it'll get stuffed. I don't like that. Everything should be honest, by the rules. Like this, under a vast mat, mat and covered with some straw. There, that's grand. Beautiful. Books. Look at the books, said another Muzik, taking out Prince Andre's bookcase. Don't snag on anything. It's a real load, boys. Hefty books. Yes, they wrote and do didn't dope, said the tall, round-faced Muzik, and with a meaningful wink, pointed to the fat dictionaries that lay on top. Rostov, unwilling to trust his acquaintance upon the princess, did not approach her, but stayed in the village awaiting her departure. Having awa waited until Princess Maria's carriage just left the house, Rostov mounted his horse and accompanied her, riding as far as the road occupied by our troops, eight miles from Bogachevaro. In Yankovo, at the inn, he respectfully took leave of her for the first time, allowing himself to kiss her hand. Shame on you, he said, blushing, in reply to Princess Maria's expression of gratitude for her salvation, as she called what he had done. Any policeman would have done the same if only we had to... If we only had to make war on Muzhiks, we wouldn't have let the enemy get so far, he said, embarrassed at something and trying to change the subject. I'm only happy to have had the chance to make your acquaintance. Goodbye, princess. I wish you happiness and consolation and wish to meet you under happier circumstances. If you don't want to make me blush, please don't thank me. But the princess, if she no longer thanked him with words, thanked him with the whole expression of her face, radiant with gratitude and tenderness. She could not believe that she had nothing to thank him for. On the contrary, for her, it was an unquestionable that if he had not been there, she certainly would have perished, both from the rebels and from the French, that he, in order to save her, had subjected himself to the most obvious and terrible dangers, and it was still more unquestionable that he was a man of lofty and noble soul, and it was still more unquestionable, or a lofty and noble soul, who had been able to understand her position and her grief. His kindness and honest eyes, with tears welling up in them at that time when she herself, weeping, had spoken to him of her loss would not leave her imagination. When she said goodbye to him and was left alone, Princess Maria suddenly felt tears in her eyes. And here, not for the first time, a strange question presented itself to her. Did she love him? Further on the way to Moscow, despite the fact that the princess's position was not joyful, Dunyasha, who was riding in the carriage with her, noticed more than once the princess leaning out the window of the carriage, but smiling joyfully and sadly at something. Well, what if I really had fallen in love with him, thought Princess Maria. Ashamed as she was to admit to herself that she had fallen in love first with a man who perhaps would never love her, she comforted herself with the thought that no one would ever know of it and that she would not be to blame to the end of her life to the, the she would not be to blame if to the end of her life without speaking of it to anyone she should love the one who she loved for the first and last time. Sometimes she remembered his glances, his sympathy, his words, and happiness did not seem impossible to her. And it was then that Dunyasha noticed her smiling, looking out the window of the carriage. And it had to be that he came to Bogachevaro, and at that very moment, thought Princess Maria, and his sister had to refuse Princess Andre, Prince Andre. And in all of that, Princess Maria saw the will of Providence. The impression Princess Maria made on Rostov was very pleasant. Whenever he remembered her, he became cheerful. And when his comrades, having learned of his adventure in Bogachevaro, teased him for having gone for hay and picked up one of the wealthiest brides in Russia, Rostov became angry. He became angry precisely because, against his will, the thought of marrying the meek Princess Maria 
whom he found pleasant and who had an enormous fortune had occurred to him more than once. For himself personally, Nikolai could not have wished for a better wife than Princess Maria. His marriage to her would make for the happiness of the Countess his mother and would straighten out the affairs of his father and it would even, Nikolai felt, make for the happiness of Princess Maria. But Sonia and the word he had given, that was what made Rostov angry when they teased him about Princess Volkonsky. Okay, well, we're supposed to stop there today, but I kind of think... Um, all right, let's look, read 15 as well. Let's just do one more. Getting interesting. Having taken command of the armies, Kutuzov remembered Prince Andrei and sent him an order to report to headquarters. Prince Andrei arrived into Severo Zemesich, Zemesich at the same day and at the same time of day that Kutuzov held the first review of the troops. Prince Andrei stopped in the village at the house of the priest in front of the commander-in-chief's, in, in front of which the commander-in-chief's carriage stood, and sat down on the bench by the gate to wait for his serenity, as everyone now called Kutuzov. From the field beyond the village, one could hear the sounds of the regimental music, then the roaming of an enormous number of voices shouting, Hurrah! to the new commander-in-chief. There by the gates, ten paces from Prince Andrei, taking advantage of the prince's absence in the splendid weather, stood two orderlies, a courier and a butler, a small dark-haired lieutenant, colonel of hussars, all overgrown with mustaches and side whiskers, rode up to the gate and glancing at Prince Andre as if asked if his serenity was staying there and when he should would be back. Prince Andre said he did not belong to the serenity staff and was also a new arrival. The hussar lieutenant or colonel order, turned to a smartly dressed orderly and the commander in chief's orderly said to him with that special contempt with which a commander in chief's orderly speak to officers, what? His serenity should be here shortly. What do you want? The hustler lieutenant colonel smiled into his mustaches at the orderly's tone, got off his horse, handed it over to the courier, and went up to Volkonsky with a slight bow. Volkonsky moved over on the bench. The hustler lieutenant sat down beside him. Also waiting for the commander-in-chief, said the hustler lieutenant colonel. They say he's accessible to everybody. They say he's accessible to everybody. Thank God, with those sausage makers, it's big trouble. Not for nothing did Erda Molov ask to be made a German. Now maybe the Russians will be able to speak too. Otherwise, devil knows what they've been up to. Fretting all the time. Oh, maybe that's fretting all the time. Do you know, did you do the campaign, he asked. I had the pleasure, replied Prince Andre, not only of taking part in the retreat, but of also losing in that retreat everything that was dear to me, not to speak of my estate and the house I was born in, my father, who died of grief, I'm from the province of Smolensk. Ah, your Prince Volkonsky, very glad to make your acquaintance. Lieutenant Colonel Denisov, better known as Vaska, said Denisov. I knew it was Denisov! So excited, sorry. He's great. This is going to be interesting. Denisov had a crush on Natasha, and Prince Andre was supposed to marry Natasha. <gasps> okay. This whole story, you're brilliant. So Denisov, shaking Prince Andre's hand and peering into his face with especially kind attention. Yes, I heard, he said, with sympathy, and after a brief pause, went on. That's that Scythian war. It's all very well, but not on, only not for those who catch it in the ribs. So you are Prince Andre Volkansky, he nodded his head. Very glad, Prince, very glad to make your acquaintance, he added, again with a sad smile, shaking his hand. Prince Andre knew Denisov from Natasha's stories about her first suitor, that memory now carried him back sweetly and painfully to those aching feelings which he had not thought of for such a long time, but which were still there in his soul. Recently, he had received so many other and such serious impressions, the abandoning of Smolensk, his visit to Bald Hills, the recent news of his father's death, and had experienced so many feelings, but these memories had not come to him for a long time, and when they came, were far from affecting him with the former strength. And for Denisov, that series of the memories evoked by the name Volkonsky was a distant poetic past when, after supper and Natasha's singing, not knowing how himself, he had proposed to a 15-year-old girl. He smiled at the memory of that time and of his love for Natasha and went on at once to what now concerned him passionately and exclusively. It was a campaign plan he had thought up while serving at Outpost during the retreat. He had presented his plan to Barclay de Tolly and now intended to present it to Kutuzov. The plan was based on the fact that the French line of operations was very extended and that instead of, or along with acting from the front, blocking the road for the French, they ought to act against their communications. He began to explain this plan to Prince Andre. They can't maintain that whole line. It's impossible. I'll answer for, 
I'll answer for breaking through them. Give me 500 men and I'll break through them. That's certain. The only system is the Pagreton one. I think he means partisan. Denisov stood up and gesticulating, set forth his plan for Volkansky. In the middle of the account, the shots, the shouts of the army, more incoherent, more prolonged, and merging with the music and the songs, came from the place of review. In the village, hoofbeats and sounds and shouts could be heard. Himself is coming, cried a Cossack who was standing by the gate. He's coming. Volkansky and Denisov moved towards the gate, by which a bunch of soldiers and honor guard was standing, and saw Kutuzov moving down the street, mounted on the horse a small bay horse. An enormous suite of generals moved, rode after him. Barclay rode almost beside him. A crowd of officers ran after them and around them and shouted, Hurrah! The adjutants rode into the yard ahead of him. Kutuzov, impatiently urging on his horse, went gliding at an amble under his weight and constantly nodding his head, kept putting his hand to his white, the white cap of the horse guards he was wearing with a red band and no visor. Coming up to the horse guard of the dashing grenadiers, most of them decorated, who were saluting him, he, sudden, he studied them silently and attentively for a minute with a commander's intent gaze and turned to the crowds of generals and officers that stood around him. His face suddenly assumed a subtle expression. He shrugged his shoulders in a gesture of perplexity. And with such fine fellows to keep retreating and retreating, he said. Well, goodbye, general, he added, and sent his horse through the gate past Prince Andre and Denisov. Hurrah, 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 shouts came behind him. Since Prince Andrei last saw him, Kutuzov had grown still heavier, become flabbier and swollen with fat. But his familiar white eye and the wound and the weary expression of his face and figure were the same. He was dressed in a uniform jacket, the whip hung and a thin strap over his shoulder and the white horse's guard cap. He sat on his brisk horse, sagging and swaying heavily. Hoo, 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 he whistled barely audibly, riding into the courtyard. His face expressed the joy of relief a man feels who intends to rest after an official appearance. He took his left foot from the stirrup and with difficulty swinging his whole body, wincing from the effort, lifted it over the saddle, leaned on his knee, grunted, and lowered himself into the arms of the Cossacks and Ashtons who supported him. He straightened up, looked around with his narrow gaze, and glanced at Prince Andre, obviously without recognizing him, strode towards the porch with his dipping gait. <laughs> he whistled and again glanced around at Prince Andre. Only after several seconds did the impression of Prince Andre's face, as often happens with old men, connect with the remembrance of his person. Ah, greetings, Prince. Greetings, dear boy. Come along, he said wearily, looking around and, with heavy, and went heavily up the steps, which creaked under his weight. He unbuttoned his jacket and sat down on the bench that stood on the porch. Well, how's your father? Yesterday I received the news of his passing away, Prince Andre said shortly. Kutuzov looked at Prince Andrei from wide open, startled eyes, that then took off his cap and crossed himself. God rest his soul. He will be done with us all. He sighed deeply with his whole chest and fell silent. I loved and respected him, and I sympathized with you wholeheartedly. He embraced Prince Andrei, pressed him to his fat chest, and did not let go of him for a long time. When he did, Prince Andrei saw that Kutuzov's swollen lips were trembling and that there were tears in his eyes. He sighed and took hold of the bench with both hands in order to stand up. Come along, come to my place, we'll have a talk, he said. But just then, Denisov, who had quailed as a, a little before his superiors as he did before the enemy, though the adjutants by the porch tried to stop him with angry whispers, boldly went up the steps, his spurs knocking against them. Kutuzov, leaving his hands propped on the bench, looked at Denisov with displeasure. Denisov gave his name and announced that he had to inform his serenity of a matter of great importance for the good of the fatherland. Kutuzov began to look at Denisov with his weary gaze, and in a gesture of vexation, taking his hands from the bench, folded them over his stomach, repeated, For the good of the fatherland? Well, what is it? Speak. Denisov blushed like a girl. How strange it was to see a blush from that mustached, old, and drunken face, and boldly began to set forth his plan for cutting the enemy's line of operations between Smolensk and Vyazma. Denisov used to live in that area and knew the terrain well. His plan seemed unquestionably good, especially from the power of conviction in his words. Kutuzov was looking at his feet and occasionally glancing at the courtyard of the neighboring cottage as if expecting something unpleasant from there. And in fact, during the time that Denisov was speaking, a general with a portfolio under his arm appeared from the cottage he was looking at. What, Kutuzov said in the middle of Denisov's explanation, ready so soon? Ready, your serenity, said the general. Kutuzov shook his head as if to say, how can one man have time for it all? and went on listening to Denisov. 
I give you my noble word of honor and of a Russian officer, Denisov was saying, that I will break Napoleon's communications. What relation are you to Kirill Andreevich Denisov, the commissary general? Kutuzov interrupted him. He's my uncle, your sochenity. Oh, we were friends, Kutuzov said cheerfully. Very well, very well, my dear boy. Stay here at headquarters. We'll talk tomorrow. Nodding to Denisov, he turned away and held out his hand for the papers Konovnitsyn had brought him. Would you be so good as to come in, your serenity, the general on duty said in a displeased voice. It is necessary to study the plans and sign some papers. An adjutant came out of the door, announced that everything was ready in the apartment. But Kutuzov evidently wanted to be free before going in. He winced. No, my dear boy, have them bring out a little table. I'll look at them here, he said. Don't go away, he added, turning to Prince Andrei. Prince Andrei stayed at the porch, listening to the general on duty. During the report, Prince Andrei heard a woman's whispers and the rustle of a woman's silk dress behind the front door. Several times, glancing in that direction, he noticed behind the door a plump, red-cheeked and beautiful woman in a pink dress with a purple silk handkerchief, silk kerchief on her head, holding a platter and obviously waiting for the commander-in-chief to come in. Kutuzov's adjutant explained in a whisper to Prince Andrei that she was the mistress of the house, the priest's wife, who intended to meet his serenity with bread and salt. Her husband had met his serenity in the church with a cross, and she at home. Very pretty, the adjutant added with a smile. At those words, Kutuzov glanced up. Kutuzov listened to the report of the general on duty, the man, the main subject of which was a critique of the position at Tzavero Zamesich. In the same way he had listened to Denisov, in the same way as he had listened seven years earlier to the debate at the Austerlitz Council of War, he obviously listened only because he had ears, which, despite the fact that one of them was stopped up with hemp, could not help listening. But it was obvious not only that he could not be surprised or interested in anything the general on duty could tell him, but that he knew beforehand everything he was being told and listened to it only because he had to listen, as one had to listen to the singing of a prayer service. Everything Denisov had said was practical and intelligent. What the general on duty was saying was still more practical and intelligent, but it was obvious that Kutuzov despised both knowledge and intelligence and knew something else that was to decide matters, something that did not depend on intelligence and knowledge. Prince Andrei followed attentively the expression of the commander in chief's face, and the only expression he was able to notice on it was one of boredom, of curiosity about the meaning of the woman's whispering behind the door and of the wish to observe propriety. It was obvious that Kutuzov despised the intelligence, the knowledge, and even the patriotic feeling shown by Denisov, but he despised them not with his intelligence or feeling or knowledge, for he did not even try to show any. He despised them with something else. He despised them with his old age, with his experience of life. The one order Kutuzov added personally to this report was concerned with the looting of looting by Russian troops. At the end of the report, the general on duty presented his surrender with a paper to be signed concerning remuneration by the army commanders at a landowner's respect for green, request for green notes that had been mowed down. Kutuzov smacked his lips, shook his head, having listened to the matter. Into the stove, into the fire, and I tell you once and for all, my dear boy, he said, into the fire with all these things. Let them cut grain and burn wood as much as they like. I don't order it or allow it, but neither can I punish them for it. It's impossible otherwise. When you chop wood, the chips fly. He glanced at the paper once more. Oh, German scrupulosity, he said, shaking his head. And that is the end of section 15. So we did three today. Oh, hey. Thank you for joining, Mums. Just in time. Um, in time for me to leave. We're going to wrap it up there for today. Um, if you missed anything, this video will be added to the War and Peace playlist. So definitely jump on there and drop any comments or questions uh, on the video. And I hope everyone is staying safe and smart out there. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a great day.